So it's my great pleasure uh, today to uh, talk to Dr. Wayne Jonas. Um, Dr. Jonas is a widely published research scientist, practicing family physician and professor of medicine at Georgetown University and at the Uniform Services University of the Health Sciences. He is also a retired Lieutenant Colonel in the Medical Corps of the United States Army. He now advises national and international organizations on ways to implement evidence-based healing practices in the medical systems and serves as the executive director of some really integrative health programs. Um, welcome to the show, um, Dr. Jonas. Thank you, Dr. Meyer. It's a great pleasure to be here. And I just want to start off by congratulating you on your new book, uh, The Mind-Gut Connection. I was so glad to see a book like that come out from uh, a, a gastroenterologist, <laughs> someone from the gut side. I thought that was a great, a great, uh, to, a great, uh, great uh, um, a description of the very complex nature of what goes on inside us and how it affects what goes on outside of us. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. And so, I mean, obviously, you know, one of the reasons, I mean, we've known each other for, <clears throat> for many years, decades, I would say, and uh, I don't know anybody who's really impacted the field of whatever you want to call it, integrative medicine or integrative health in a way as uh, Dr. Jonas has um, on multiple levels, organizational healthcare system research um, practice. Um, and I was delighted to see that um, uh, Dr. Jonas's book has come out and um, so this is highly recommended to anybody who's interested in in an evidence-based book on this topic. Um, yeah, I appreciate it. Well, you know, after, uh, you know, over 35 years of practice in mainstream medicine as a primary care doc, uh, you know, I saw a lot of things uh, that happened around the world from traditional healing practices like you have seen and investigated over your career uh, as well as, you know, standard mainstream stuff that I did every day with pills and procedures and surgery and some real miracles that occur on that side. And, uh, you know, I, I really wanted the public to understand, especially when it comes to chronic illness, not so much acute uh, disease, which uh, in the West, we, we pretty much have down. We can, we can manage acute disease and uh, uh, you know, we can save people's lives. We can stop an infection. We can, uh, you know, keep you from bleeding out. We can uh, treat your heart attack or remove a tumor. Um, and that's a miracle. I mean, uh, the things that killed us 100 years ago, infectious diseases and the consequences of trauma uh, aren't killing us anymore. And um, a consequence of that is that we now have an aging population. And an aging population tends to have a lot of chronic illnesses. And chronic illnesses are a lot more complex. Uh, they have multiple factors that contribute to them. They involve not just the physical body, but the social body, uh, the emotional body. Uh, they uh, involve spirit, the mind and the spirit, and they involve your behavior. In fact, uh, as I write in the book, uh, for chronic illnesses, most of health around chronic disease and healing occurs uh, outside of your doctor's office. It's not inside the doctor's office. Mm -hmm. We're leaving uh, without addressing those uh, underlying determinants of health, the lifestyle factors and other kinds of social factors. We're leaving 80% of the opportunity to help people heal from chronic disease on the table. And I thought that was important for people to know uh, and to partner with their doctor so they can, they can address those areas. And I talk about how to do that with your doctor in an integrative fashion. Uh, and that's why I use the term integrative, because you've got to do it with conventional medicine. Uh, evidence is a key factor on that, and uh, behavior and lifestyle are a key factor for that. And they need to be done together uh, in partnership with your, with your doctor. Yes, it's something that my colleagues in mainstream medicine are not aware of. They have no uh, idea about how um, how much the patients uh, and healthcare providers actually are seeking out um, a very alternative approach to health. I'm a little bit skeptical of, of many of the things that are being propagated in in this community. I mean, there's you know it's 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 a universe that includes that spans from supplements to um, um, uh, non evidence uh, based treatments. And they're being presented as it were a science, and they're mixed together with hardcore, uh, you know, headlines that come up in, the, in 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 top journals like Nature and Science. But they're mixed in a way that, as a 
as an evidence-based physician, I, I can't really, uh, you know, subscribe to that. And so reading through your book, and um, I'm, I'm going to quote one, one paragraph, it does seem that you have come to the conclusion based on your wide experience and uh, that the treatment of chronic health is not necessarily something that um, you only can use the kind of things you, you, you learn in medical school or you learn in um, educational activities or CME activities, um, but that you pretty much can, that, that everything can be used in a similar way as long as it's part of a ritual um, that, that sort of includes the patient and the environment and the, um, but what you actually do in terms of, is it a pill, is it an herb, or is it a supplement, doesn't really matter that much. Is, do you wanna comment on that? Yeah, sure. Well, as, as, as you know, Emran, I'm a, a scientist and have taught research for many years. I ran a medical research training program at Walter Reed uh, in my uh, work with the Office of Alternative Medicine at IH. Uh, I was talking about science and the importance of science as the primary path. And in my book, in chapter four, I describe the in incredible power of science to discern what works and what doesn't work with truth from falsity in those areas. Uh, and uh, in that process, I also have realized, and this doesn't come as my opinion, this comes from the data actually, uh, uh, heads of huge uh, research organizations uh, like uh, Stanford and Harvard have said the same thing, um, is that when it comes to chronic illness, uh, you know, the way we do science where we sort of divide people up into parts and then we look at small parts and look at influences to try to prove that those things produce influence, uh, that gives us a tremendous amount of knowledge. And when we find things where there's a single cause and it produces the effect and you can eliminate that, then miracles occur. Uh, but in most chronic diseases, that's not the situation. There's multiple factors and when you find one single cause, you find one single cause. And when you put it back into the body to try to use it as a treatment, it produces modest effects, even under the best of science. Uh, we see this all the time. Uh, it's, uh, we call the rest of it, uh, the part we didn't look at, uh, uh, or we controlled for the placebo effect. Uh, and in a lot of chronic illnesses, where there's multiple factors like that, even proven, uh, treatments using high quality rigorous science only contribute about uh, 20 to 30 percent to the overall healing effect. The rest of it comes from other things and uh, sometimes it's just spontaneous improvement that occurs. You know, uh, that's called in statistics the spontaneous regression to the mean. Uh, sometimes it has to do with the ritual and the belief that goes on in those areas and then that's what most people think of of the placebo effect. Um, but actually what we hold up in our brain individually is less important than what our culture holds and what the ritual that the culture delivers the healing is. And this has been shown for many, many decades. Arthur Kleinman from Harvard demonstrated it. Ted Kapchuk runs the Center for Placebo Studies at Harvard right now, and he looks at that whole effect. Um, uh, and so, uh, you know, it's very clear that science is very helpful for differentiating small components within chronic disease that work and don't work. Uh, but we have to keep it in perspective how much it act those, those individual components that it ferrets out actually produce. And uh, if the ritual is producing, you know, the other 80%, then we ought to figure out how do we optimize that no matter what the element is that's in there. And just make sure that the agent that you're using, the particular treatment, is not harmful, is not costing too much, and can be done in a way that uh, that can optimize that sort of those other factors and not leave them on the table. Um, yeah, I, mean, I, I mean, I could not agree with you more. I mean, so throughout my career, um, you know, spent really decades developing um, or trying to develop novel drugs for chronic digestive uh, diseases. Um, I've also been involved in what was viewed for a while as the, um, the, the potential drug of the century, this molecule that would block the central stress response and basically treat all the um, um, stress sensitive disorders. Um, and all these experiments were done in, in mouse models or rat models where we isolate everything and, yep. um, and they work beautifully. I mean, so, um, but then when, when this went into the clinic in patients with depression, patients with chronic pain, 
it had absolutely zero effect, which is, was a shock to me. I mean, after, yeah. after 10 years of research of identifying exactly that mechanism, um, and, and, and it has really changed my own view of this fundamentally. I mean, uh, yeah. Another example, um, and again, coming back, because that's, you know, happens to be one of the areas I'm most interested in, chronic digestive diseases, I've seen it come and go that specific drugs were developed uh, after years of research, millions of investments from pharmaceutical industry targeting sp specific receptor mechanisms, usually in the gut on a particular cell. Um, those work in the animal experiment, but in human studies, there's not a single drug that has been developed, and that includes also probiotic for IBS that would have uh, more, um, more effect than 10% above placebo. So yeah. Placebo is the much bigger part. 10% above this with all this um, scientifically developed medication. And that's another thing. So I've ended up at exactly the same point as, as you have in viewing that chronic disease is clearly something, something very different from, from acute care medicine. And I agree with you, I mean, it's obviously yeah. Modern medicine has been phenomenal, even in some chronic illnesses like, like cancer. I mean, I think with some, um, but that's not what what the what the majority of of illnesses and health issues um, are, yeah. are, are are related to that we're talking about here, and that, that that you talk in your book, really. Right. No, that's right. I mean, things the, the majority of things like cardiovascular disease, diabetes, obesity, COPD, uh, you know, lung disease, uh, hypertension. I mean, these have as much to do with, uh, yes, we have medications that can help, you know, address those, but the true healing of those has uh, more to do with lifestyle and behavior than it, than it does the drugs. And we don't have a system that's very effective in delivering those kinds of things. I mean, uh, we only spend about 5% of our healthcare dollars on prevention. Uh, and the other 95%, we wait till people get sick and then we spend money at it. And that's part of the reason why our healthcare costs are going through the roof here in the United States and our outcomes aren't getting all that much better. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we need to change the thinking about this to address the underlying determinants of chronic illness and make that at the center of what, uh, of what, we, de of what we deliver in healthcare. So I'm mean, staying with this topic and we're gonna get into this in the second half of the interview uh, in, in, in more detail, but does it matter if somebody goes to their you know, to a natural, to a natural path or some healer or functional medicine person, um, or to um, somebody who's really into behavioral medicine, uh, does that matter? And if you portray yourself as a holistic healer, but in reality, um, you make your income based on the supplements that are on your website um, and ever more complex and obviously tremendous placebo effects because, yeah. You know, people like that have typically written bestsellers and uh, on TV shows. And but how how do you see? I mean, how do you get around this ethical thing? So things that we know are not evidence proven, um, but on the other hand, you could say they're part of the ritual, and the, the person that gives them to you has managed to become the the ultimate placebo enhancer. Um, if you get better with that treatment, is is, is that something? That, that is okay, or should this be? And we know that even if you tell the patient it's a placebo, it will still work from. It still works, right? Yeah. <laughs> Depends on who said, who tells them, but yeah. <laughs> but, but this is something that I've been struggling with. No, I think you're absolutely right. And I actually write about this in my book. You know, I, I get pushback from this book uh, from both the conventional side and the alternative practitioners. And oftentimes they push back as much as the others because I show examples in there where uh, failure to do integrative health, where you're really bringing in good science into these areas, uh, creates a problem. Um, uh, you know, there's a, I tell the story of a patient of mine that I call Trevor in the book who abandoned conventional care for his high blood pressure because he thought uh, the, he believed the alternative practices and the supplements and the diet could cure him. He did that for over a decade until he went into renal failure. It didn't work. And then he got into real trouble. Mm -hmm. And that is as much a failure of integrative medicine uh, as it is not integrating it. And so I really emphasize the importance of bringing together three things in my book. One, the conventional treatment that you're, and the science-based treatment that your doctor provides. 
Number two, evidence-based complementary and alternative approaches. And there are some of those, as you know, mm -hmm. uh, that have been tested in good controlled trials. And then lifestyle and self-care approaches. And again, ones that have been shown to work in those areas, not just anything that you read off the internet in those areas. Uh, and that three, the, those putting those three items together is what I call integrative health. Mm -hmm. And that is the kind of medicine that we need in order to properly uh, do that. Now, right now, patients are going out, uh, you know, taking supplements, visiting alternative practitioners, and then they go see their doctor and they, <laughs> there's no communication. And they're trying to make, you know, decisions about what should they use and how should they use it without any kind of knowledge or education or, or, mm -hmm. or uh, orientation even towards good science and evidence. And so it really is... Uh, the responsibility, in my opinion, of the conventional doctor uh, to take on this responsibility of doing integrative care, especially in chronic illnesses and integrative health care. And so I urge doctors, and I actually provide a tool in my book that I call the HOPE Note, the Healing Oriented Practices not Environments Note. And I recommend that doctors do a HOPE visit with their patient, uh, an integrative health visit with their patient, after they've done the normal types of uh, diagnostic and therapy components that uh, that they've done initially to be sure that they know what the patient has and they know what the evidence is uh, to help them. You know, I know from my colleagues who, um, who are hired as full-time clinicians at the university hospital, um, so they're encouraged to, you know, cut down on their follow-up visits because they don't generate as much money, cut down on the time for the follow-up visits, um, see as many new patients, stay to a time limit for the new patients. If they don't follow that, they will get some notice from the administration, from the administration um, that they're falling below the level that would pay for their negotiated salary. So how do you get um, from, you know, the, 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 the kind of healthcare that you can deliver and I can deliver um, to making this a, a, a practical uh, service for, uh, for everybody? I mean, that's... Uh, yeah. Well, that, that's a great question, and that's exactly the dilemma and the problem that I'm trying to help solve, uh, not only with the book that describes the issue and, and an approach, but also on my website, I'm trying to populate uh, my website with free tools that pr practitioners, physicians, and patients can use to actually make this happen in our current system. Um, so I won't pretend it's easy, okay? We have a system that has not been built to do this, and uh, it's spending a lot of time and a lot of money <laughs> uh, trying to do it and doing it not very well. Uh, now, our system is attempting to move in this direction, and there's terms for this. So, uh, for example, some of your listeners may have heard something called value-based health care. Mm -hmm. An attempt to go from volume based, which is what our current most of our current system is the you know see more patients, do more procedures type of approach and get paid for that over to outcomes over to improvements in patients' health and there are attempts to do that um, insurance companies are now trying to do that employers are trying to do that uh, family physicians and primary care docs and other doctors are trying to do this uh, at this area. If you look at the literature, they keep talking about how to move into value-based care. Uh, now, I, I would say for right now, for many physicians, it's still trying to fit a square peg in a round hole. <laughs> uh, and that means they're going to have to trim things a little bit and, uh, you know, uh, try to adapt uh, the visit uh, to be able to do this. But it is possible. I give a number of examples of systems in the book. And then also we're populating more and more of these on the website uh, of systems that are doing this successfully, that are doing value-based care successfully, where the outcomes are improving, the costs are going down, and they're able to fit it into a payment model that currently exists within our system. So it is possible to do. Uh, it doesn't mean it's easy. Uh, but what I recommend to both patients and to uh, physicians is that they just start. They just begin the process. And in the hope note, I lay out a number of questions that they can ask within their 20-minute visit that they get uh, to begin to get at the underlying determinants of health, the behavioral components, the social components, the social and emotional and the mental components. 
And then using group, using things like health coaches, group visits, shared decision making, these are all tools that are available right now to your average doc. They can begin to actually shift. And I've had many patients, and I tell several stories in the book about patients that when we've done this, they've been able to actually engage in their own healing process and together actually get better from even some pretty severe chronic illnesses or if they have high risk factors, preventing those risk factors from progressing. So it is possible. Uh, it's not easy. Yeah, and I should mention, um, this book is not only, um, like your, your book is not only unique in terms of addressing some really exciting novel science approaches, like from the, you know, the whole placebo science systems, um, biology, whole systems medicine, but it also gives some really practical, I mean, this is what I liked about it from, from patient stories, you even um, um, you know share the story of your own family and your wife, which is beautiful and really moving. Um, and 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 you do provide these these tools to the to the physicians that, that, that can use it. So um, I, I think it was also a great idea how you promoted your book in the first place to get this to as many interested people as possible, because clearly there is work to do in terms of changing both the philosophy of um, traditionally trained physicians and the attitude, um, but also healthcare administrators. And um, so I, I think that's a, that's a great part of the, 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 the book. Thank you. And let me ask you some other aspect of this. So clearly there's um, the, the, the Samueli Foundation has made this, um, um, together with the Samueli family, this phenomenal gift to uh, the University of California in Irvine. Uh, amidst a lot of criticism from the traditional healthcare um, community that this kind of thing is shouldn't doesn't need to be part of a medical school, but I think um, it actually demonstrates, you know, the vision that you have to bring this in in medical school and train the physician of the future in in, in this kind of um, a different view of health and medicine and and teach them the uh, tools that uh, that uh, that they would need for this. So, do you think there will be and hopefully there will be more um, efforts like that. Um, do you think for the future, this will form the basis of really training different kinds of physicians that, that see this as a standard and no longer as something totally novel and outside of their main, main area of training? Yeah, I think this will become standard health. Uh, I think value-based healthcare and an integrative model is the way we have to go if we're really going to effectively deal with chronic illnesses in these areas. And, and I, I'm encouraged uh, by the students and the residents that I work with uh, because there's a lot of interest and enthusiasm in doing this. They want to do this. You know, I just, gave, I just got finished doing a 14-city book tour. And in every one of those cities, I also gave a grand rounds at an academic medical center where we talked about what is integrative health, what's the hope note, how do you do it, what questions do you ask, et cetera. And in every one of those, there was a great interest among the young physicians, especially the residents, the medical students, et cetera, uh, trying to find out how to do this. In my own uh, practice, I work in a family medicine residency. I teach residents. Uh, and I'll give you an example. Um, uh, so we had a, a patient that came in with chronic back pain, low back pain, it was a resident base, a resident referred them, a primary care referred them, and we, I was seeing them with a, with a resident. And this was a woman that had a, over a decade of chronic back pain, multiple, multiple treatments, injections. Uh, fortunately, she hadn't had surgery, but she was on three medications, an antidepressant, an opioid, non-steroidals, physical and therapy, et cetera. She ended up on disability because she actually couldn't work with it. And she came in and we did a, uh, an integrative health visit with her and we went through the whole questions that I outlined on my website and I put in the back of the book with the resident. And it, it took us, uh, you know, had, we, had she been my patient, I could have done it in 20 minutes, but I took an hour because I had to hear first of all the, uh, the diagnoses and treatments that she'd gone through first. But then I started asking her what she did, uh, you know, to treat her own condition. What did she do? And after she said, well, I take this drug and that drug, I said, okay, I understand you need help with the drugs. And we have a pharmacist on our team who is part of that. 
Uh, and after she said, well, I don't need to go see the psychotherapist, I talked to the behavioral person who we also have on our team and said she needs assistance in this, not psychotherapy. Uh, and what she uh, determined with us is that, that stretching and heat really helped her a lot. Uh, but she had gone to a yoga class and she tried to do what the woman in the front was doing, twisting all up this, and she'd injured herself. Mm -hmm. And so she needed uh, an evidence-based yoga therapist, someone that knew how to do good, effective yoga therapy that science had demonstrated uh, to uh, actually treat her back pain. But she needed more than that. She needed her family to support her in it. So we had to bring them into the discussion and she needed her attitude to change. She had to see that she could actually get better and that her back wasn't her enemy. And so we got her into a evidence-based yoga therapy component and we worked with this team and she was able to implement therapeutic yoga in her own life. Her family supported it. And within about four or five months, her pain levels had markedly dropped, her function had improved, and she even started going back to work. Now, she had spent 10 years using the healthcare system and expending lots of money and lots of time to treat her pain. And now within a period of a few months, we were able to get her back to full function. That's the kind of system that young people are interested in. Physicians want to figure out how to do that. And it's a matter of simply properly thinking about what are the core determinants of a person's health getting them engaged in the treatment itself and using good evidence to put it together uh, with our conventional care. Taking, taking into consideration there are these multiple dimensions that determine this person's chronic illness, I think is really a key and um, not that difficult. I mean, so often, you know, uh, I mean, often patients say, oh, you, you're taking all these difficult patients. Is actually, they're not that difficult. They're yeah. just... They're, they're, they're just their problems are just not amenable to the traditional um, medical system. I mean, that's right. Well, that's you. you you've hit it on the head uh, here. It it uh, it it requires a rethink. It requires a way of looking at the patient and dealing with the patient that is simply a, sort of a different approach. Uh, and as you say, it's not all that difficult if we would do it. And so we need a system that supports that. We need. Uh, physicians and healthcare providers, other types of healthcare providers that are trained in this, and we need to design uh, the way we approach patients uh, to make it easy uh, rather than uh, rather than a struggle. Um, one one other uh, area that um, I, I found really fascinating in, in your book, and uh, personally I, I couldn't agree with this more, um, is this whole concept of the whole systems. Um, you know, I mean, the whole system's view of health and, 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 and disease um, with the model you bring in. And so, I mean, you know, maybe you want to explain this more. Um, I personally view this as almost like it's, you could either call it a paradigm shift to go to understanding of our, every aspect of our reality in terms of systems um, from the internet to, to uh, you know, trillions of microbes interacting in your gut. Um, every, science has coined these terms um, omics, so whenever we look at these systems of genes or cells, it becomes like omics or transcriptomics. Um, but you know, I mean, you, I, I mean, you could also say it's 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 back to the future because it's not something totally new that we that that we have come up with. We've come up with the science to prove it, but but right. in terms of the concepts, I mean, they're ancient concepts. So maybe you want to say more about your own uh, view on that and how you described this in your uh, in your book. Yes, no, I think you're right. And and you you actually had described this in your book too, is the, what does a whole system science look like? What does personalized preventive medicine look like? Uh, where does the role of genes come into that? And and it is sort of back to the future. These, uh, these are the same kinds of concepts that were talked about many, many uh, centuries ago, if not millennia. Um, I think that, uh, you know, most people get it. They know, for example, that they're not simply a, uh, a sack of chemicals. And even if you can explain a lot of things using the, uh, the molecular um, approach that we take in Western medicine, 
uh, they know they're more than that. They know that uh, their their behavior and their behavior makes it important. They they know that their their emotions are important. They know that the group and the social support that they live in, their family and friends, their loves and their fears, all make up uh, an essence of who they are. And they know that their mind and the spiritual components uh, is also part of them. They don't ignore that. And so in many ways, the model that I talk about when I talk about sort of a whole person, it involves these sort of four key layers that everybody intuitively knows makes them up. (laughs) Their physical external environment, their behavior, their social and emotional environment, and their mind and spirit. And so all I'm proposing in this book is that we acknowledge that and we actually ask questions to the patient and we incorporate those dimensions as pathways to healing in the encounter. And everybody has a different pathway. They used to call this the biopsychosocial model, right? That was another term that was thrown around in the, in the, in the, uh, the 1960s, et cetera. Uh, and the, the exciting thing about when you look at a whole system uh, and a whole person is that it gives you many ways to enter into a healing journey. And so you can personalize and make things patient-centered. You know, uh, uh, you know, two decades ago, there was a famous report that came out from the National Academy of Medicine, Institute of Medicine, called Crossing the Quality Chasm. And it said the person should be in the center of the encounter. And this is where the whole issue of the person-centered medical home came and person-centered care. Well, how do you do that? You actually have to ask the patient what matters to them, not just what is the matter. And so in the hope note, what I try to get to is find out what matters to the patient. I'll give you another example. This is a per, this was a, another guy with chronic pain. I see a lot of patients with chronic pain. Uh, In this case, he'd had 20 years of back pain, and he had had surgeries and this type of thing. And he came in, and I asked him this question. I said, if you uh, were perfectly healthy and could do whatever you want, what would you do? What is the most important thing for you? What matters to you? And he could immediately tell me. He said, you know, the biggest problem I have is I can't get in a car and drive five hours and get on the floor to play with my grandkids. And he said, that is the most important thing in my life. I said, more than pain? He said, more than pain. So I took him over to the physical therapist and I said, okay, I don't want you to do the pain approaches you were doing for his back pain. I just want you to work with him to get up and down off the floor. Okay. It took him about three to four weeks before he could do that. She worked with him regularly. He did, but you know what? It mattered to him and he worked through the pain and he did those exercises. There was no lack of compliance here going on. Yeah, Yeah, no, I can see. And in about three months, he could do that. And he, he came in to see me and he said, doc, I just drove down five hours down to my grandkids and I got down on the floor and I played with them. Thank you. And you know, about four months after of continuing to do that, his pain got better. Uh, And so this is, this is an example of how when you find what matters to the patient, that gives you the way in to help them incorporate and become their own healing agent. Uh, And, and this is what I mean by the inner aspect of healing. Where And you can use a lot of different, and some people like nutrition instead, and some people like movement, and some people, you know, they like stress and stress management. I simply look for what is their venue into tapping into their own healing capacity, and then I bring evidence in and support in to help them accomplish that. Mm -hmm. And I think this is the model that we need to do uh, in chronic illness, and it means that we pay attention to all those dimensions of what a person is that we tend to leave on the table when we only ask about the external molecular environment. Uh, In genetics, we call this epigenetics, right? (laughs) This is the epigenetics, the surrounding part of the genetics. And I think um, whole systems uh, medicine that we're we're doing now with with personalized medicine and the genome uh, aspect, we're gonna, we're developing a science that is going to allow us to really do this whole person care much better than we've ever done before. How this systems approach is, is gradually becoming the new paradigm within science. Uh, yes. So away from the reductionistic, typically the, so the way most scientists get their grants to isolate everything into one single cause and effect um, paradigm, um, 
work with animal models that eliminate every environmental influence uh, or isolate it to a single thing. Um, so my feeling is, I mean, there's, there's still a battle going on in NIH study sections because the yeah. traditional scientists are still trained in the, you know, very successful way, but it's just not applicable to many chronic uh, disease problems. Um, so to get a grant through that is based on systems biology is still a major challenge, a lot harder than doing the doing it the traditional way. But I, I, I think in the future, what I could see happening is a convergence of uh, what you're talking about in uh, in your uh, in your book to integrating all these different parts into the treatment of a patient with a change a paradigm shift within the basic science so you no longer have a science that studies the small parts really well but they start to understand the whole system as well so it's obviously happening at the brain level the connectome project um, yeah. it's happening at the microbiome level uh, that we can't understand the microbiome based on a single organism. I mean, it's the yeah. ecological, the ecology. So I actually look at this quite optimistically that I think after a certain transition period and with the efforts that, that you know, that uh, you and the, the Samuel Ali Foundation has put into this, um, that, that there will be a, a convergence of a much cheaper and much more effective healthcare, a true healthcare system, not a disease care system, but... Um, right. No, I think that, that yeah. that's absolutely right. And in, in chapter eight, I talk about whole system science, uh, as you've just described it, exactly as you've just described it. It's sort of like in practice, you ask, how do people in practice do this? And, you know, they're part of, we're sort of halfway in value-based medicine, halfway in volume-based medicine. Same thing in science, isn't it? I mean, we're halfway stuck in the randomized control trial where we've got to, you know, isolate a particular thing, and that's the only evidence that we count, right, or we think is the best evidence, and we're halfway into a whole system science, which is going to radically shift that uh, and guide us using good science without that type of uh, testing everything through randomized, uh, you know, yeah. study. And if we can get our economic system to begin to buy into that, too, I think that's the key, both on the science side in terms of funding of uh, research and, and uh, approvals by FDA, as well as the coverage side on insurance and, and healthcare. Now, that's, that's going to create a, uh, an approach that's going to help us develop and deliver the kind of science-based uh, chronic disease management system that we need today. And so I think you're absolutely right. We're moving in that direction. And um, my hope is that this book and, and the website are pushing us a little bit further that way. No, no it absolutely will. I mean, I'm convinced of that. So let me just come to a, to a couple of, and maybe you just want to, we touched on these topics, or maybe you just want to give it a brief um, summary. Um, so we talked a little bit about this, the four domains of, the, of an optimal healing environment. I mean, you coined this term, optimal healing environments, I think, which is a really important idea. And you have these different domains. Maybe you want to say a few yes. words about that. Yes, the, the four domains and an optimal healing environment is bring it brings together the four dimensions of what a whole person is. Uh, and I, I described them briefly earlier in this conversation, but they're the external environment, the body, they're the behavioral components. Uh, there's the social and emotional components, and then there's the mental and the spiritual dimensions. And so an optimal healing environment, if is about a, a system that looks at all of those dimensions and then is designed to help address those dimensions in healthcare and health disease. Um, the HOPE note, the Healing Oriented Practices and Environment note, is a way to create those same kinds of optimal healing uh, processes in the normal everyday medical encounter. Okay, so it's a set of questions that you can ask yourself or you and your physician can ask together to get at the underlying personal determinants of health for you as a whole person and make sure you haven't left a whole dimension out. So that's what an optimal healing environment is and that's what a hope note is. Uh, and I provide tools rec uh, um, uh, recommending that this kind of visit can be done and can be done right now. One last sort of comment is, I mean, I, I've, I've, I've attended one of these sessions at the, um, um, at, the, at, the, at the Samueli um, um, Institute at the time in Alexandria where people from the military were there and you, you coined this, this term, this total force fitness, 
So yeah. you would you would think that's kind of a um, that the that the military services and the VA would not necessarily be the the main proponents of of your new way of looking at medicine. Do you, do you want to say just a couple of words about this? How successful that has been? Yeah. Well, you know, one of the things that many of my listeners and readers find uh, surprising is how the military and the VA have embraced whole systems approaches. Uh, the military likes to say they're first out, <laughs> meaning they're first to the mission, but they're also the first to innovations in healthcare. And so they have completely embraced a whole person, whole system approach uh, when it comes to health and optimal functioning. And Total Force Fitness was a, uh, a product of working with the former chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, the commander in chief of, of the military, uh, in which he wanted a whole systems, whole person model for optimizing function, building resilience, preventing illness, and improving health and, and function. And so it looked at uh, all these dimensions. It, worked, it looked at more than just the four dimensions that I mentioned, but it just split them up into to, to smaller components. And out of that came multiple activities that are currently going on, both in the DOD and in the, the, the military and in the VA. Uh, there's a the Healthy Base Initiative. The last Surgeon General did something called the Performance Triad, which was sleep, nutrition, and activity as the three areas that every healthcare practitioner should ask. Those are three in my behavioral dimension, for example. Mm -hmm. um, they're now doing entire counties where they're looking at altering the health of the county because they found they weren't getting healthy enough people to be recruited into the military. Mm -hmm. Uh, the Veterans Administration has just announced uh, that it is setting up 18 centers of excellence in whole person, uh, whole system health around the country, where they're actually going to put the same components of integrative health that I talked about before, conventional medicine, evidence-based complementary medicine, and self-care in the center of the delivery of their care system. And so uh, they're out, they're doing this. And it's a matter of the rest of our country, I think, coming and catching up to it, uh, to do it uh, for, the, for the rest of us. And the Samuele uh, Foundation and the program I run for them, uh, uh, Integrative Health Programs, and my website, drwaynejonas.com, is all geared towards trying to make that easier uh, for uh, our healthcare system to do, as well as for patients to begin to do this in their day-to-day -day lives. Fascinating story. Well, thank you so much for for the time taken to to uh, to talk to me about this. And so I, I just want to reemphasize, you know, I'm showing the the book again. This is clearly a book that every physician, every medical student, and every patient with a chronic disease it's a must read because you will find things in there that um, uh, some of them will surprise you. Some of them will say that's what I thought all along, but I never had somebody put it together in, in, in such a in such a convincing way. Thanks, Dr. Jonas. It was great talking to you. Well, thank you, Dr. Meyer. And uh, I'll urge your listeners to get that along with your book to show the <laughs> mind-gut uh, connection as, as you've so eloquently described. <laughs>